Good afternoon. My name is Willis Eschenbach. Some people say that they are believers in global warming, and some people identify themselves as skeptics. I myself am a climate apostate. Now, an apostate is someone who leaves the church and speaks out against the tenets. And the tenet I speak out against is the entire concept of climate sensitivity. The idea that there is a linear relationship between the forcing and the temperature. Back around the turn of the century, Arrhenius made the first estimates of what he thought the climate sensitivity would be. He said around three degrees from a doubling of CO2. About a third of a century ago, we got our first modern estimate, which was that it would range between one and a half degrees and four and a half degrees, with a central estimate of three degrees. Now, in the most recent uh, IPCC report, we get the uh, news that the sensitivity is between one and a half degrees and four and a half degrees, with no central estimate. Since the 1980s, when the first estimates were made, we've seen a huge increase in computer power, unbelievable changes in computing ability. We've seen an immense growth in the complexity of the models. We've put millions of dollars and millions of man and woman hours into the, into the puzzle, and we've ended up worse off than when we started. To me, this is a clear indication that there is something wrong with the question that we're asking. And I say what's wrong is that the idea of climate sensitivity is a chimera, it's a hoax. Not a hoax, that in implies uh, intention, but it is, a, it is a wrong path. Now, to me, when I started studying climate, the, the, the thing that amazed me about the climate was not that it was changing, but that it was so stable. Over the entire 20th century, the climate changed, the global temperature of the Earth changed by plus or minus three-tenths of a degree. The system is running at about 290 Kelvin. That's less than a tenth of a percent. And as someone who has tried to keep engines running that tightly with governors, I can assure you that implies some kind of a thermoregulatory system. So what might that system be? My hypothesis is that it is comprised of the emergent phenomena of climate. Emergent phenomena are phenomena that when conditions are right, they appear, when they last for a certain amount of time, when conditions are no longer favorable, they disappear. One of the most common is dust devils. Nobody thinks about dust devils, but they move immense amounts of heat from the surface up to the uh, lower troposphere. We have no measurements of how many there might be, as far as I know. Nobody has even any estimates of how much energy they might move. But like all emergent phenomena, they only emerge when the temperature is high at the surface compared to the atmosphere. The first uh, part of my hypothesis then was that because I was living in the tropics, that in the tropics where most of the energy comes from, that the temperature there was regulated by the emergence of cumulus clouds and thunderstorms. And uh, this was uh, my hypothesis, and like any good scientist, I looked for evidence. And this slide here was the first piece of evidence that we had, that I could find. And uh, you can see that the beauty of this is it's uh, photographs taken from the sun. My problem was I needed some place to stand where there was no winter and no summer and day and night and all the kinds of confusing things that we have. And if you go and look from the sun, you'll notice that from the point of view of the sun, that's noon. It's always right under the sun. Over there is always dawn. And on the right is always sunset. So we've traded time coordinates for space coordinates. And my hypothesis was that during the day, in the morning, we'd see, as you do in the tropics, clear skies, and it's cool. That lets the sun come in and warms the tropics up. As soon as it gets warm, typically around 10 o'clock, we see a big increase in the albedo. 
as the clouds form. Very soon we have a fully developed cumulus uh, field above us, rejects maybe 400 watts per square meter, cooling the earth immensely. Then, if the, if the temperatures continue to rise, we get thunderstorms. They also cool the earth. And this was where I was at the last uh, meeting in Chicago. And since then, as scientists do, I've continued to look for evidence. I, my next uh, look was at daily temperatures. Now, this is how the daily temperatures run where I live in Santa Rosa in Northern California. Yeah, oh, well, let me back up. At dawn, starts to rise, rises steadily. A little bit after noon, starts to drop, drops steadily, just as you'd expect if you believed that it was all driven by the forcing. This, on the other hand, is from the Tau buoys in, in the uh, Pacific. It's a string of buoys, an array of buoys across the Pacific. I've divided it into the, um, the coolest, which is the green, that's in the Eastern Pacific. You'll notice that looks very much like Santa Rosa does. It rises fairly steadily and drops off. Where it's warmer in the Pacific, though, we start to see the effect of the clouds. They come in in the morning, and they knock the temperature back down, then it starts to rise again and begins to drop. In the warmest parts of the Pacific, it's even more pronounced, although the clouds can't hold it as cool there, so it starts to rise more rapidly and then drop back off. This is clear evidence that temperature and forcing are not linearly related. The forcing of the sun continues to rise until noon, but the temperature is dropping. Negative sensitivity, if you were to believe in temperature sensitivity, as I don't. Another, so that was a prediction that I had made, which I went out to look for evidence for. Another uh, corollary of my theory is that if it's true that um, we are seeing a, a, a throttle in the Pacific, we should see that albedo is positively correlated with temperature in the Pacific. And here is that uh, graph. This is from the series uh, global data set of, of radiation. This is the correlation between albedo and temperature. As you might imagine, up in the, you know, near the poles and up on the, up on the uh, uh, land, we get snow in the winter. And in the spring, as the temperature goes up, the snow is melting, so the albedo is falling. But the exact opposite is happening all over the tropics. As it gets warmer, you get more and more clouds and more and more clouds. These clouds reject the energy and keep the temperature within a narrow range. I next looked at the El Nino. Here on the left is El Nino, on the right is La Nina. We are looking at a cross-section. At this end, this is at 100 west, and we're looking out west across the Pacific, out to 140 east, somewhere uh, around the Asian continent. When we have excess heat in the Pacific, it builds up on the surface, as you might imagine. Now, people think the El Nino and La Nina are separate phenomena. In fact, they form a pump. One is the instroke, where it all builds up, and then the winds come and blow, and they blow all that energy straight west until it hits the, hits the continent, and it splits and runs out to the poles. So it's a giant pump that pumps hot water from the equatorial area to the poles. As it's doing that, it's exposing the cooler water underneath, and that, of course, cools the atmosphere. So it's doing double duty in the way of cooling in that it has run east and pumped all the, all the heat to the poles, and it has also exposed the cool area. And like all of the uh, phenomena that I've been describing, it is temperature-based. Clouds don't form because the sun is strong. They're not a function of forcing. They form because the temperature is rising in the tropics. And if the temperature is not rising, they don't form no matter how strong the forcing is. Uh, 
It is a temperature-based threshold, not a forcing-based threshold that is in charge of the thermal regulation. And as a result, this entire system, including the Pacific Decadal Oscillation, which alternately either impedes or improves the transfer of energy from the equator to the poles, is all temperature-based, and it comes into existence only when it's needed. Finally, here's a most recent piece of evidence that I've uh, found. Uh, this is average U.S. sunlight hours. It's a curious data set I just came across. And as you can see, since about, oh, back up, since about 1940, it's been dropping. Uh, the trend over the entire period is about minus 1.8 hours per month per decade. Is this, uh, what does this show or what does this demonstrate or what does this prove? I'll give you what is perhaps the most important thing a scientist can say about this thing. Heck, I don't know. <laughs> Seriously, if more scientists were willing to say, heck, I don't know, we would be in a much better situation today. Now, I may have to run because I have an early uh, flight. This is my information. Uh, you're free to note down uh, the website that I write for, Anthony Webb's most excellent website, whatsupwiththat.com. In that regard, let me say, join the Open Atmospheric Association that he's setting up. It looks like a very good association. Send me an email. I try to answer all of them. My thanks to you all. <laughs>